hey, this is happening. This is happening. Hello. <laughs> This is also a really sexy eye look. Hello, I felt like doing makeup today and it feels good. It feels great. We're doing amazing, sweetheart. Hello, greeting friends. Welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new. My name is Mel and today I bring you guys an oddly requested video. Now, for some reason, a lot of you guys went to see this particular video and I had it in the drafts for a minute there. I hadn't quite made a proper list, kind of compiled the books and the movies and the TV shows that I wanted to talk about because I thought I wouldn't have any. And when I actually sat down to kind of craft the list, I realized that there were a lot more than I was anticipating. So today I am going to give you some book recommendations, but it's going to be a very special video because the dynamic for this is going to be based on a movie or TV show that I have watched and really really loved in the past what book is similar to that that you can possibly read and honestly it goes either way if you really enjoyed the book and you haven't watched the movie or the TV show you could watch that and vice versa so I think it's a really nice one overall I think it's a win-win situation also as always if you guys have any really really specific ones that you'd like to recommend down in the comments please feel free to do so as always you guys know that I love to see what you guys think what relations you guys have made between books and movies or TV shows. Let's get right started into this one. I think it's gonna be a cool one, but the first one that really jumps out to me because the relation between these two, it's almost scarily accurate. It's like too identical and perfect. Don't know if a lot of you have watched this movie. Every time I mention this movie, nobody knows what it is. And it is called Run. I watched it last year with my brother and it was honestly a really engaging thriller. And the movie basically follows a mother-daughter duo as they go about life with a very interesting dynamic. The mom is is a really overpowering presence. She is very literally overbearing. She is super strict about her rules and about all the things that Chloe, the daughter, can do. In fact, Chloe is forbidden from going to most places. She is kept almost on this tight leash. And soon enough, as the movie starts and kind of starts progressing, you kind of get to see how the mom is a much darker presence than you'd initially assume. Now, I do have a manga recommendation for this one, and it is Blood on the Tracks. Now, as I was reading this one, I remember telling my brother, like, this is so similar to the dynamic that we saw in Run. And it was so interesting to me because although the outcome is not the same, they are very much different in the succession of events that we get throughout the story. But I think the premise at its core, it's very interesting. It's almost like what is a mother willing to do in order to protect their kid? And just as Run explored all of the dark parts to this premise and didn't shy away from being absolutely horrible and completely mind-blowing, Blood on the Tracks is very similar to that. This is still an ongoing manga series, but I definitely do think it's worth checking out. The first one is definitely, out of the ones that I have read, the creepiest one. I was constantly turning those pages and I kept shying away from the page because the illustration, it's not gory, it's not horror in the way that you typically see it, but the way that everything is drawn and the attention to detail is just so unsettling that as you read, you kind of want to stop, but not at the same time. So I think these two are the perfect combination. Another one that is really interesting to me because every time I bring up the show, it's also a show that not a lot of people seem to know or the ones that do know it didn't necessarily watch it, but it is Make It or Break It. I used to be obsessed with the show when I was younger because it was all about gymnastics. I wanted to get into gymnastics when I was younger. My mom would never let me. I was always in dance classes. In fact, I was in dance classes for all of my life. I started when I was five years old. And so this show kind of gave me the escapism that I needed aside from the Olympics and whatever event I could watch from gymnastics. And it is a teen show, so you can guess that we follow the lives of all of the different girls in the show. And particularly, we follow them in the competitive landscape of gymnastics and how they overcome all of these obstacles, again, together and separately, and all of the friendships and relationships that come with it and all of the hardships that come from being such an intense athlete. It's just really interesting. And the gymnastics routines, I was living for them when I was younger. I don't know how much of the show holds up now, but I do have a book that I read last year that really reminded me of that, and that is Head Over Heels. Now, this is a book that is completely centered around gymnastics. The author herself was a gymnast, and so you can tell all of the care and love that went into this particular book. And it, coincidentally enough, also overlaps a lot with the themes that we got to see in the Athlete A documentary that talked about all of the events with sexual assault within the American Gymnastics Association. So honestly, it could double for either Make It or Break It or Athlete A, whichever of the two. And in this one, we follow Avery Abrams, who was on track to become an Olympic gymnast, except that during trials, she got 
a really serious injury that completely retired her from gymnastics at the time and she never really got back into it. Since then, she's had this really standoffish relationship with gymnastics up until she gets this opportunity to coach a young girl who is also on track to become an Olympic gymnast and she takes the opportunity and gambles with it. For me, the beautiful thing about this book was not necessarily the romance because the romance definitely took a backseat on this one. It was more so the relationship between Avery and Hallie that really jumped out at me as I was reading and how they were constantly there for each other and how they gained each other's trust and how they continuously propelled forward against all of these adversities that they had to face as gymnasts, as women in the sport and everything that comes with it, which the unfortunate reality is that there is a lot of unwanted presences in this sport. There are unfortunately a lot of predators and people who are targeting young girls and so I think the book not only did a beautiful job at addressing all of that but it also did a phenomenal job at describing all of the gymnastic routines and the care that goes into it, the love, I guess the finesse that goes into them too. It really was beautifully written and I had a great time reading this. Next up I obviously have Shadowhunter slash City of Bones, whichever of the two you want to use for this one they both apply. And for this one I am grabbing more so the setting and the feel of it and the way that things are exposed in the story. I am grabbing the fey lore that Cassandra Clear used for this story in particular and how it was included both in the movie, the TV show, and the books as a whole as a franchise. And for that one I am going to recommend A Dark and Hollow Star by Ashley Shuttleworth. I think this world in its essence felt very similar to the Shadowhunter world. It's very urban fantasy and I think what Cassandra Clare managed to achieve within that urban fantasy setting is very similar to what we got to see here. The center of this world is truly at the eight courts of folk which are mainly fey and the story kickstarts as we start seeing these ritualistic murders in Toronto. So first of all the setting is in a city setting. It is set in Toronto, Canada and as the story starts unfolding and the murders continue happening we find follow these four POVs, four individuals, four queer teens who each hold a piece of truth that need to come together in order to find out exactly what is happening in this world and why these murders are happening. I think in particular when I think about the murder situation, I think more so of the dark artifices which still lives within the Shadowhunters world. I also think Cassandra Clare does this very interesting thing where she doesn't shy away from using the original Fey lore where Fey's are not supposed to be nice people. They're not supposed to be these romanticized, glorified, incredibly nice and giving beings. They are cruel and they lie and they have ulterior motives and they have agendas and they do a lot of things for personal gain and there's always war and conflict and it's not as simple as meets the eye. And I think with the Unseelie Court, particularly in the Shadowhunter setting, you get to see that a lot. And I think this one, again, doesn't shy away from that. They really did a great job at establishing this world where, again, the Fae are not meant to be nice. They own a up to their cruelty and they own up to all of the gore. It's extremely graphic in all of its themes. The world building in this one also really reminds me of a high epic fantasy sort of world building where it might potentially feel info dumpy but it all has its purpose. I think Ashley Shuttleworth really managed to write a story that felt very connected. Nothing felt out of place, really felt well thought out. Everything had its own little nook and corner to go in and I really appreciated that about the book. The characters are really fun and with and now Sakea at its core, who is one of our main characters. She really just reminds me of Jace. It's like a female Jace. If you read this book and you read Nausicaa, there's even a lot of scenes that kind of mirror City of Bones in a way. I truly enjoyed my ride with this one. The twists are also really freaking great. And the next movie on the roster is Get Out. I feel like this video wouldn't be complete without me talking about some books that I've read that were not only pitched as Get Out, but a lot of elements actually inside the book, the content itself, really Really delivered on that front and really resembled to the movie in a lot of different ways. I think both of the options I have right here did the inclusion of the movie and its elements very, very differently. And in this movie, we follow an interracial couple. We follow Chris, who is black, and his girlfriend, who is white. And we follow them in this journey as they go visit the girlfriend's family. And I don't know if we come to find out the horrors that hide behind the doors of this house, to say the very least. And for this one, I have two different options within two different 
different age groups and the first one is When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole. This is an adult thriller and I think it was marketed in the wrong way. This book is not, in my opinion, a thriller. I think if you go into this book expecting it to be a horror instead, it will deliver a lot better. Thriller and horror have very different beats. They feel very, very different as you read and the outcome of this book, especially towards the last third, felt very horror-esque. But in this one we follow Sydney Green who has grown up and has lived her entire life in Brooklyn, New York. And as the book starts, she starts seeing a lot of weird things happen in the neighborhood, things that she hadn't necessarily spotted before. Neighbors leaving and new people moving in, white people in particular moving in, stores closing that she is a recurring customer in, and a lot of other odd happenings happening. That's a little bit redundant. Around her, keep her on her toes and basically make her wonder exactly what's happening, if she's crazy, if she's not, if she's seeing things, if she's not. And I think it's that part right there. Where do you kind of push those boundaries between what you know is real and what isn't? That part really reminded me of Get Out. If you've watched the movie, you'll understand. If you haven't and you'll watch it, then you'll understand. But I think that part was masterfully done in When No One Is Watching. There were definitely a lot of scenes that, as I was reading, I continuously went, what the fuck is happening? Like, what, what is this craziness? And that is exactly the feeling that Get Out gives you. I think also beyond the pushing the reality barrier moment situation, I think it's the very last third that really reminds me of Get Out, that really reminds me of that kind of gore and violence that we got to see within the movie that isn't particularly in the other option that I'm going to give you. But I think this one and all of those elements truly delivered and it addresses important conversations as always about race and gentrification. And you got to see some very real things in here. Like we say in Spanish, no tiene pelo en la lengua para echar el cuento, which is basically somebody just told things how they are. And that is exactly what Alyssa Cole did in a lot of these scenes. And some of them still had a note of comedy in them, which made the story even more breathable at times. It was really, really good. And I think in hindsight, I probably did enjoy this way more than I thought at first. And the next one I have is obviously Ace of Spades. And this one is a little bit different because this is YA and the things that it addresses, it does so very differently than when no one is watching did. But in this one, we have an academy setting. So it borderlines on dark academia and the academy is called Navius Academy. It is a primarily white high school and we follow two black students, Chiamaka and Devon, as they are the only two black kids in the school and they start being targeted by this online anonymous presence called ACES. And ACES holds a lot of important information that could genuinely hinder both of these characters' introduction out into the world and higher education and just their lives in general. It just continuously makes it hard for them to exist in this space. We know where that commentary is leading and I think Farida, honestly, I've talked about this book so many times by now, but Ace of Spades is truly a masterpiece and a cultural reset in so many different ways. It is obviously pitched as Get Out. It could also double as a Gossip Girl sort of book because that is its other pitch. Even down to how the book starts, one of the first few scenes that we get with Devon, it just right away pushes, again, that sort of barrier against what is reality and what is fictional, what is happening and what isn't really happening. And differently to what when no one is watching did, which was more so about racism in the regular day-to-day -day life as you walk down the street in your neighborhood about gentrification, this talks about it more in a school setting and how it can be so much more masked than you'd believe and how students and teachers and entities in and out of themselves can create such a horrible setting for people of color, for black kids in particular, and cannot say enough great things about this book because I think not only did it deliver wonderfully on the get outside, but it also had so, so much more and I was horrified reading this book. I cried and it also had its beautiful moments, right? Which is the part that I really appreciate about Ace of Spades is that even in the midst of the craziness and even in the midst of all of the horror, there is kind of a light at the end of the tunnel and there is always hope and there is always people that will be there to support you and there will always be love and it, it was a beautiful book. All in all, I just talking about it gives me shivers. So yes to all of it. There's just not a single thing about this book that I disliked. None. It's, it's a perfect book in my eyes. Next up, I have my most recent watch, which as you guys know, if you were able to watch my Q&A, you'd know that I recently finished watching Flower of Evil, which is a K-drama, and it is one of my all-time favorite shows now. 10 out of 10, plot twist, storyline, character development, everything just delivered in so many different ways. It was one of the most amazing things I have ever watched. The acting, the music, everything just worked so incredibly well. It was honestly, once more, perfect. And if you don't know what Flower of Evil is, about. If you 
haven't watched it, first of all, watch it, and then also read the recommendation that I'm gonna give you next because I think it's perfect. In Flower of Evil, we follow a married couple, and the wife is a detective, and then the husband is kind of a craftsman. He works a lot with metals, he has his own shop, and soon enough, the wife gets wrapped up in this investigation of serial murders, and what she doesn't know is that her husband could potentially be a psychopath, also the one who's committing the murders, and that this is all essentially a game of cat and mouse for the both of them. In and out of itself, the game of cat and mouse is Death Note to me. And I know, talking about Death Note, why you're recommending Death Note Mail, everybody's read this. I know a lot of people have it, and even for the anime, I personally really loved the anime. It's what got me into anime and manga, so it holds a really special place in my heart, and I think it really works perfectly for this particular setting. We have a detective, and then we've got a person who is borderlining on that either sociopathy side or psychopathy side and who is committing all of these serial murders and this one obviously borderlines more on the fantasy horror sort of route where Flower of Evil it's strictly realistic sort of thriller mystery but I think at its core it's very very similar in the way that they are constantly not only running circles around each other but they are constantly outstepping and outrunning the other in many different instances throughout the show or throughout the manga. We follow Laito Yagami who is an A plus student. He has everything going for him quite literally. He is so smart and so dedicated to everything that he does. And then one day out of nowhere a death note falls from the sky and it is a notebook containing the power of a god of death which are called the Shinigami and essentially whatever name and whatever form of death he writes into this journal into this notebook ends up happening exactly as he wrote it. It gives him immeasurable power and then we enter this detective called L, who is a super genius. Quite literally, he knows everything. Things that we don't even know. And he is dead set on catching Laito and stopping him at all costs. And again, it is the perfect game of cat and mouse because both of these characters are incredibly smart, which is exactly what happened in Flower of Evil. And you constantly got to see kind of that sense of respect between these two and how they were enjoying the chase, even if they wouldn't admit it at times because it was so tedious and it was so insidious and there was just so many moving elements to it and so many things to kind of foresee and stop or carry out but they have this sense of respect because they are equally as smart and they kind of they kind of accept and embrace each other as each other's equal and it was so interesting to see a story like that I don't think I've ever quite seen it be done like this in any sort of media and format which is why I think Death Note has been so successful if you've read this and are looking for something somewhat similar Flower of Evil could be the one another potentially cheesy one but I do have The Haunting of Hill House. Now, this is one of my favorite shows too. I watched it when it came out. I watched it with my mom. And then we had to sleep in the same bed for a couple of nights because neither of us could sleep on our own because we were still spooked by the fucking bent neck lady. Like, it was ridiculous. The show is honestly really good. The cinematography in it was so incredible. It reminded me a lot of the Kubrick style, but that's a conversation for another time. I don't know why I'm going into dissecting cinematography styles. Point is, I really enjoyed the show. And in that one, we follow five siblings as they had a very supernatural paranormal experience within this mansion that they used to live in when they were younger and now as grown adults they have to kind of go back and face their fears and see exactly what went down within that house and this might be sort of a cheesy answer for this one because I think a lot of people have read this book there's also a lot of people who haven't but whichever the case Home Before Dark by Riley Sayer could potentially be a really good one for The Haunting of Hill House as a show I haven't read the book and I know the book is very different but at least for the show I think it works really well at the core of its premise. Once more, kids who had a paranormal-esque experience when they were younger in a particular manner. We have here. Grown adults, years later, have to go back and face their fear and see exactly what went down in this household when they were younger. That's exactly what happens here. In this one, we follow Maggie and her dad was a writer. And when she was younger, they used to live in this really big mansion. In fact, her dad wrote a memoir, a non-fiction book detailing all of their experiences, all of their paranormal instances in this household. And now, as her father has recently passed away, Maggie sets out on this mission to go back to this manor, revamp it, 
flip it around, resell it, and face her fear once and for all and figure out exactly how much of her father's memoir is true and how much of it is actually fictional. I really enjoyed this book. I don't tend to read horror very often just because I do believe in the supernatural and it fucking scares me. And so I tend to kind of read this in passing every once in a while so I don't get spooked, but this one did a really great job at being equal parts thriller and horror at both spooking you and having a lot of passive parts to it, which I guess it's the perfect recipe for a horror anything. It really kept you on your toes as you were reading and you never truly knew up until the very end whether this was actually paranormal or not. So it was also kind of borderlining on that is it reality, is it not reality sort of elements that I apparently by the looks of it really enjoy. And it just worked for me a lot. And it is definitely a book that I would consider to reread in the future, especially because I have heard from Liv, apparently by the looks of it, the very, very end scene or something close to the end kind of defies the plot twist that we got. It's it's honestly a very interesting book and the way that it was carried out was really, was really good to me. I, of course, had to include the originals in here because I never finished watching the show and it's still something that I might potentially do in the near future. However, I grew up being a Vampire Diaries fan and of course, I watched the originals when it had first come out and I loved every second of what I watched. You guys know I'm a Klaus sucker. I used to write Klaus fan fiction. Am I concerned about the fact that I am so proudly admitting this in the internet? Just a tiny little bit. However, in this one, we have one of my favorite atmospheres and that is New Orleans. There's just something about the atmosphere that just does it for me every single time. And in this show in particular, we follow the original vampire family as they come to New Orleans and they take over the city in a way and they reminisce about their olden times in New Orleans and how they built the city, etc, etc. And I think this book is perfect for this for several reasons. Of course, it has to be The Beautiful by Renee Adier. Now for this one, we obviously have vampires and we have werewolves, but we don't have it in a really overt sort of way. I think Renee Adier in this book really does a great job at telling you what they are without telling you what they are, hinting at what they are. But I really enjoyed the intrigue and mystery. It's like, I know, I know what they are. Like I just, in my core, I know. But I was still hooked to know and to find out exactly how this world worked. And I think for that, job well done, because even though I knew, I was still intrigued to see, again, how the ins and outs of this universe that she had created necessarily worked. And then obviously we have the setting. We follow Celine as she comes from Paris. She is a dressmaker and she arrives to New Orleans in the 1800s. And once she gets there, she involuntarily gets involved into a war between species, between the creatures of night. And slowly but surely, there's also a serial killer that's after her. So it's all really fun and fresh for Celine. Not really, but the setting for this one really reminded me of the originals. And you get to see the witchcraft and the vampires and the werewolves and the serial murders and the investigation and what's happening and the slow burn romance and the danger in the city, but that you also, it's the dresses and it's the way that they talk and the way that they address each other. And everything about this book really just reminded me of the show. And even past that, kind of really reminded me of the 1864 flashbacks that we got from season one of The Vampire Diaries, if I'm being extremely specific. And I loved every second of it. I read this book in one sitting and I had a lot of fun reading it. How could this be? A TV show or movie? Two book recommendations if this wasn't in here because it's the one thing that I continuously compare it to. And that is Heroes, the TV show, which is also one of my favorite shows of all time. I think this show did so many things right, especially for its time. This show came out in like the mid 2000s nearing 2010 and we follow a group of gifted individuals who all have powers and how some of them if not all of them need to save this world from this apocalyptic event and in the midst of all of this craziness there is of course experimentation and a lot of wonder about how these people got their powers if they were born with them if they can acquire them how exactly it all works and if it's curable or not it has a lot of facets to it I also think the rep in this one truly fantastic like I just I love the show. It did almost everything right. And I say almost because there's a few things that I also don't adore, but overall it was a really solid show. And of course for that one, I do need to introduce Vicious by V. E. Schwab. I'm sure there's other books out there that could potentially be a lot more similar, especially from the rep aspect. I think the core of this book also really resembles heroes. We've got two college students, Victor and Eli, who are roommates, who are friends, who are currently holding experiments together to kind of figure out how the EOs, the extraordinaries gets their powers and they themselves subject themselves to all of these experiments and ultimately it leads
leads to a lot of chaos. But again, it's that element of experimentation and really figuring out how these people get their powers, to what point of death do you need to carry your body in order to acquire these? What limits truly exist for all of these capabilities? And what sort of abilities can you acquire as well? So I think overall the premise is really interesting. I think the characters also are very complex in their nature and they mirror each other in a lot of different ways. It also, like Heroes, talks a lot about this very fine line between good and evil, about villainy and godhood, which I found really interesting because a lot of characters, both in Heroes and in Vicious, constantly toe that line and go from one place to the other and kind of do whatever needs to be done at the instance where they are at at the moment. And I think it's really interesting to kind of address that, I guess, conversation or to bring up the topic about how nobody is 100% good and how arguably to some people maybe nobody or some people once more are not wholly evil. And I think all in all, V.E. Schwab really carried out beautifully in this stunning standalone novel. It's not a standalone novel, but we pretend that it is in this household. I hope you guys are ready for a bit of a stretch because for this one, I have Game of Thrones. I know the show is very similar to the books. I haven't read the books yet, so let's not go there. We have a lot happening at once. I am more so looking at one particular family that kind of jumped out at me in the relation that I made to another book. Also, of course, we've got dragons, so I think you know where this is going. I think it's pretty obvious. And that would, of course, be The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. Now, this one is very different, obviously, to Game of Thrones. We don't have a very similar narrative in the slightest. In Game of Thrones, we follow all of these different families and how they all kind of grapple for power. And then we've got a wall that separates the people from this endless winter and all of these zombie-like, god-like creatures who want to just take over the world, or seemingly so, and murder everybody. And then we've got a war happening on the other side, and then we've got dragons on the other side. It's a very, it's a very intricate world and story. Whereas in this one, we still have a world divided. Look at that. A queendom without an heir. There is an heir in Game of Thrones, so that part is irrelevant. And then an ancient enemy awakens, which is still very much true for Game of Thrones. So I guess the first and third line of the bigger pitch synopsis for the Priory of the Orange Tree is very similar to Game of Thrones in a way. And I think what really jumped out at me was particularly Sabran's family. So as we start Priory of the Orange Tree, we have Sabran, who is currently the queen of this kingdom. And her family follows this very particular religion. And they really have installed that religion onto people. They have kind of forced people to follow the doctrine. But they are very ruthless in the sense that if you don't believe, or if you go outside of the belief, or if you challenge the belief, you get murdered. And that part right there really screamed Lannister. I think specifically Cersei and Joffrey is what really jumped out at me. People that if you do not believe or do not go with what they say, they will go out of their way to poison you and murder you, maybe not with their own hands, but through somebody else's hands that they command. So Sabrin's family really reminded me of the Lannister slash Baratheons in whatever way you want to look at it. And of course, on the other hand, we do have the dragons, which are a big part of this story, though the dragons are not in every single page, like the beings, the, the monsters, the creatures themselves were not in every single page. They were still at the core of the story in a very similar way that they are in Game of Thrones. Like, if you've watched it, if you've read them, you know that the dragons are a prevalent part of the story. There's history books on the dragons. There's still a lot of it that is kind of unknown in a way, or at least in the show it was. And I think Priory in a lot of those ways mirrors Game of Thrones. And so it might be a really obvious answer, and I think it's worth a try. And those are all of the recommendations that I have for you guys today. I hope that you guys enjoyed this one. Don't forget to smash that like button if you did. Let me know down below if you have any others that you would like to recommend to people. To me as well, let me know all of that down in the comments. If you've read any of these, if you think they are similar or different in any sort of way. Also, let me know down in the comments. I love to chat with you guys over there. Don't forget to subscribe down below if you haven't already for more bookish content over here on the channel. And if you want more exclusive content and to just support the channel a little bit further, I do have a Patreon. It is always linked down below. We call ourselves the Citadel. So if you would like to check that out on all of my social medias that is always linked down below if you reach the very end of the video. Let's leave a skull emoji down below in honor of Mr. Death Now, which I love with my entire being. I love you guys so, so much, and I shall see you on the next one. Bye, guys.